Hello YouTubers and welcome to JK Lenses review of the Nikon 50mm f1.4 AFS lens. As usual this review is in four sections. Firstly we run down the specification list for this lens and then have a look at its handling in everyday use. We check out its optical performance and then see how well it compares against some of the possible alternatives which are available. Nikon have been making fast standard lenses for a very long time indeed and the 50mm f1.4 AFS version is the latest in this evolutionary chain. It represents a step up from the previous AFD version because it has Nikon's latest AFS focusing system. This means the lens is focused ultrasonically by the silent wave motors on board, rather than mechanically via a screwdriver blade from the camera body. It has the very fast f1.4 aperture, making it a full two stops faster than a typical f2.8 prime lens. And although Nikon did make f1.2 lenses back in the day of manual focus, this makes it amongst the fastest autofocus lenses that Nikon make today. Also unlike its predecessor the AFD lens, it's a G lens which means it has no aperture ring and will need to be used with a camera body that's capable of setting the aperture electronically. Right the way back through the heritage of this lens through the early days of autofocus and manual focus lenses, Nikon's fast standard lenses have been built around a seven elements in six groups design. This AFS lens marks a departure from this long tradition, being eight elements in seven groups. However, as it's not trying to provide any extreme focal lengths or wide zooming ranges, it gets the job done without the need for any newfangled things like nano coatings, ED glass or aspherical elements. The lens is a relatively small package being about 7.5cm across and 5.5cm long and weighing in at well under 300 grams. At the front of the lens it takes the slightly unusual 58mm filter size and comes supply with a plastic bayonet lens hood. This lens's 50mm focal length means that on an FX format body it works as a standard lens. This means that it has an angle of view which is roughly the same as the central area which the human eye is sharply aware of. And this means that it'll take photographs where the perspective of objects is roughly the same as you'd get by just looking at things with your eyes alone. Although everybody's different, the focal length which has been calculated to give this normal angle of view and perspective on 35mm film or an FX sensor is about 43mm. However, lens manufacturers in the 35mm and FX formats have generally offered lenses at 50 and 55mm focal lengths as their standards. Incidentally, the exact size of this standard focal length depends on the size of film or digital sensor format that you're using. This is why on DX format cameras this standard angle of view and perspective is achieved with a focal length of only 35mm, and on medium or large format cameras a focal length of 80 or 90mm is needed to achieve the standard lens angle of view. To give you a rough idea of how this works, imagine standing in front of this hill with this view in front of you. If you were to keep your eyes and your head completely still and pointing straight forward, then you'd find it quite difficult to be sharply aware of what's going on in all four corners of the photograph. This is because this photograph was taken with a 35mm lens, which on an FX body has a much wider angle of view than the standard lens at over 60 degrees. Here's the same view taken with the 50mm standard lens, and you can see straight away it's much more feasible to keep all parts of the scene in your central vision without needing to move your head or your eyes at all. For this reason the relationship between the objects in the final image, or the perspective, seems very natural. In contrast, the 24mm lens, with its angle view of over 80 degrees, crams far more into the picture than your eyes could normally manage. And this gives the particular perspective which we associate with wide-angle lenses. Conversely, using a focal length like 70mm puts only a small section from the middle of the scene into the final image. This once again gives us a slightly unnatural perspective, the one that we've come to associate with telephoto lenses. If you want to use your camera to record the world around you as you remember it, then a 50mm standard lens is a pretty indispensable item with its unique ability to make the things around you look completely natural. Although this is about the fattest 50mm f1.4 lens that Nikon have produced, it's still a fairly small unit. And with only one ring and one switch, handling is never going to be a very complex topic. If we start our tour of the lens at the back, the first thing that we're pleased to see is the rubber weather sealing ring. Although I couldn't say I've ever used this lens in extreme conditions, it's spent many hours in some very soggy weather with me, and there's never been any sign of moisture getting in. Whilst we're at the back of the lens, it's encouraging to see a strong metal construction for the bayonet mount, since the outside of the lens body seems to be made of Nikon's tough plastic. Moving forward on the lens, we pass the lack of an aperture ring and come to the familiar auto manual focus switch of all Nikon's AFS lenses. When set in the M position on the right, the lens behaves entirely as a manual lens and you have to turn the focus ring in order to focus the lens. When set in the M stroke A position on the left, the lens will be auto focused by the camera body but you have instant manual override of the focus simply by holding and turning the focus ring with your hand. Moving on down the lens we pass the familiar focus scale, as usual calibrated in feet and metres. And in front of this is the slender focus ring with its rubberised grip. 
In manual focus, this is smooth, light and easy to turn, and the lens is completely internally focusing. The front element doesn't move or turn as the lens is focused. As you can see, getting the lens to autofocus back and forth between infinity and its closest focus distance produces a fairly brisk autofocus operation. However, for such a small and simple lens, one might have expected a slightly zippier autofocus action. And I think part of the reason for this is that the lens has a relatively close closest focus distance of just under half a metre. Although this isn't a macro lens by any means, this feature is extremely useful, allowing you to get in close and take photographs of small details. Nevertheless, this does give the lens a relatively long distance to travel, between half a metre and infinity, for my focusing test. In real life, when you're focusing on objects at much more everyday distances, they really do snap into focus almost instantly with this lens. At the very front of the lens, things are all pretty straightforward. There's a generously deep and good quality plastic lens hood, which can be reversed for easy storage. Combined with the fairly deeply recessed front element, this does an excellent job of keeping stray light out of the lens. And although the lens takes the rather unusual 58mm filter size, the front element of the lens doesn't move or rotate during focusing, making the use of filters particularly straightforward. In my experience, one of the most useful things about the 50mm f1.4 lens is the real-life feel which it gives to all the photographs taken with it. No matter what you're photographing, the 50mm focal length gives the objects in the picture a perspective very similar to that of the human eye, meaning that you generally end up with photographs with a real sense of actually being there. Although it's not one of the classic portrait focal lengths, the 50mm f1.4 can work extremely well in this area. Whilst the traditional portrait focal lengths of 80, 90 or 100mm are particularly good for head and shoulders shots, the 50mm lens can work very well for more full length portraits. Although its shorter focal length means it generally has a thicker depth of field than the usual portrait lens, the ability to open out the aperture towards f1.4 means it can still be an excellent isolator of subjects. As shown in this picture where, helped by the natural fall off of light from the flash gun, it's doing its very best to lose a very distracting background. The lens's wide aperture can be combined with its relatively close minimum focus distance as another way of helping to isolate subjects. In this picture, the red warning sign is little more than half a metre away, which naturally reduces the depth of field quite dramatically, and so this photograph could be taken at nowhere near the lens's widest aperture of f1.4. In fact, if this photograph was taken at f1.4, it wasn't actually possible to keep the two edges of the warning sign in focus at the same time, and this picture is actually taken at f5.6. Nevertheless, the ability to shoot at f1.4, f1.8 or f2 means this lens is able to isolate subjects like no other at this moderate focal length. As you can see, optical quality when wide open at f1.4 remains excellent, and the lens complements this perfectly with very smooth and natural bokeh at all times. Back in the day of film photography, there were definitely two reasons for wanting an f1.4 50mm lens. The first of these was its ability to isolate subjects, which we've already looked at. The second was its unparalleled light grasp, pulling in four times as much light as a fast f2.8 lens. Nowadays, when digital SLR bodies can cheerfully shoot at thousands or even tens of thousands of ISOs, this second reason is far less relevant. Nevertheless, when you balance its uniquely natural perspective and superb ability to isolate subjects against its relatively small price, weight and size, then this lens comes up with an extremely high value for money rating. In addition, the very wide f1.4 aperture gives a wonderfully bright viewfinder screen and allows the focusing system to deliver pinpoint accuracy. As you might expect from a modern Nikon Prime lens, it delivers extremely high levels of sharpness and contrast and impeccable levels of colour saturation meaning that it can pretty much always justify its place in my camera bag, no matter what the occasion. If you're already part way out the door to go and buy one of these lenses, then I'm sure you're going to be very happy with it. However, in the interest of making this sound like a balanced review, I guess I have to do my best to try and find something wrong with it. I think I've probably come up with two things, neither of which is likely to bother anybody in real life use. Firstly, I'm always interested to see that theoretical equations give a focal length in the mid-40s as giving an angle of view equivalent to that of the human eye. In this respect, I sometimes find the 50mm focal length to be a wee bit too long, in particular when I'm sat in front of large buildings where I've convinced myself that I can fit the whole building into my angle of view. I often find that the 50mm focal length is just a wee bit too narrow. As it's not always possible to move further back, the excellent 35mm f2 is the obvious solution here. This is hardly a failing of the 50mm lens, but is something that I come across quite regularly. Secondly, there's the issue of the relatively high levels of barrel distortion in this lens. Surprisingly, even higher than that of earlier 50mm f1.4 lenses. Having owned this lens since shortly after its release, and having used it on a fairly regular basis, I really can't think of a single photograph I've had to throw away as a result of barrel distortion. Even if I look back at photographs of very flat things, or things with lots of horizontal and vertical lines, I really can't see much evidence of this barrel distortion. 
Nevertheless, the barrel distortion is very definitely there, although I have had to take photographs specifically to illustrate it for this review. You can see the curvature in this straight line along the top of this close-up photograph of a small section of my garage door, and again in the far rail of this completely straight piece of railway track, photograph from an extremely strange angle. I think this is another example of where the Nikon designers, in juggling the compromises that are involved in the design of any lens, have had to accept a relatively high level of barrel distortion, but have cleverly placed it within the lens's performance in such a way that it's very unlikely to affect anybody's everyday photography. As I've said, although the distortion is there, I wasn't able to find a single real photograph for this review where it could be said to have intruded to any degree. Given these two fairly feeble attempts at grumbling, I think you can see if you buy this lens, you're not going to have any worries about its optical performance whatsoever. If you're after a fast standard lens for a Nikon FX body, then this lens will most definitely get the job done. It offers Nikon's prime lens quality in a small and not too expensive package. However, there are cheaper alternatives available at 50mm, and if you want a slightly wider or narrower standard lens, then there are some excellent primes available at the 35 and 60mm focal lengths which are worth having a look at. At the 50mm focal length there are basically two alternative paths you can go down, either by going for an older version of the f1.4 aperture, or by settling for the slightly slower f1.8 aperture. If you like the sound of the f1.4 lens in this review, then one way of saving nearly half its cost is to go for the f1.8 version. This will save you the best part of half the cost of the f1.4 lens, for the sake of half a stop of maximum aperture. In terms of everything else, such as features, build quality and optical performance, I've always found it to be pretty much indistinguishable from the f1.4 version. In other words, it provides a largely indistinguishable package for about half the money. Unless you're convinced that your kind of photographs could only be taken at f1.4 and couldn't possibly be taken at f1.8, then the f1.8 AFS lens is definitely worth a second look. The second way of saving money on the 50mm f1.4 AFS lens is to take a trip down the memory lane of its evolution. Since this lens has been in production in almost every generation of Nikon lens, there's a wide variety of AFD, AF and manual lenses to choose from on the second hand market. Stepping back in time, the first of the AFS lenses predecessors we come across is the AFD version. The most significant difference is that it's focused mechanically via a screwdriver blade attachment from the camera body, rather than by the more modern AFS motors. Although the AFS system is inherently much faster at focusing than the old fashioned AFD system, with a small and simple lens like this, there's very little real difference in actual autofocus speed. Although the AFS lens is marginally faster at focusing, in reality it's extremely hard to imagine actually missing a shot due to the slightly slower speed of the AFD lens. Similarly, the AFS lens's ability to override focus simply by turning the focusing ring is a nice feature, but not something I make use of with any kind of regularity. Optically, it would be extremely difficult to find any way in which the AFD lens is inferior to the AFS lens. Pretty much all the pictures in the performance section of this review taken with the AFS lens could just as easily have been taken with the AFD lens. Interestingly, as with many standard lenses, the AFD lens has a little bit of barrel distortion, but this is actually on a much lower level than that seen with the AFS lens. Consequently, unless you're particularly bothered about the handy features of the AFS system, one really would have to conclude that the AFD lens represents better value than the AFS lens. Optically, it's every bit as good, if not slightly better than the AFS lens, and on the second-hand market will retail for much less than the cost of a brand new AFS lens. Interestingly though, despite their nearly 30-year age, good clean versions of the AFD lens still command quite respectable prices on the second-hand market. In my view, this is often an indication of a classic Nikon lens, whose excellent optical performance remains in high demand, despite other changing features and fashions. Speaking personally, although the AFS version is an excellent lens, if my copy exploded in a sheet of flame tomorrow, I'd simply go back to using the AFD version with little or no reduction in picture quality. Incidentally, the eagle-eyed amongst you may have spotted that my lens here actually predates the AFD lens by a few years. The lens shown here is actually one of the very first autofocus versions of the 50mm f1.4 lens to be produced. Technically, it's an AFP or an AFN lens, which you can tell by the fact it simply says AF Nikkor on the side instead of AFD, and has the extremely skinny hard plastic focusing ring. As the letter D designates, the slightly later AFD lenses communicated distance information to the onboard computers of the camera. This allowed for slightly more accurate metering, particularly when using flash. Although once again, having owned a good number of pre and post AFD lenses, I really would struggle to find photographs that showed much difference. If you really need to keep costs to an absolute minimum, then these pre-AFD lenses on the second-hand market are arguably the very best value of all, particularly if you're not going to be doing very much manual focusing. Finally, on this 50mm money-saving theme, 
If you want nearly all the optical quality of the 50mm f1.4 AFS lens with a price tag in the tens rather than the hundreds, then there are the last two manual focus versions of the lens, the AI and the AIS. In almost all real life situations, the manual version of the 50mm f1.4 will match the latest lens in optical quality very closely indeed. Although it's a little bit softer wide open, levels of sharpness and colour saturation are extremely similar, and once it's stopped down a little bit, you're going to have to work extremely hard to see much difference between the two lenses. The obvious downside is the lack of autofocus, which would rule it out for many applications. However, if your subjects don't move, don't move very much, or move in a very predictable way, then the manual lens might well be worth looking at, as there's a very substantial cost saving to be had. A good example would be a subject like this steam train. Although it's scooting along at a fair old speed, its motion is of course extremely predictable. This means that perfectly sharp photographs can be obtained by pre-focusing on the bit of rail where you want the front of the train to be, and then taking five or six shots as the train passes through this point. I have a friend who's photographed subjects like these for publication for many decades, and doesn't actually own a single autofocus lens, since the pre-focusing technique allows manual lenses to get perfect results every time. I use the technique regularly with motorsport subjects, often using modern lenses with the autofocus turned off. If you're thinking of going down the manual focus route, then my advice is to stick to the two later versions, the AI and the AIS lenses, as you can be pretty certain of them working with most modern Nikon DSLR bodies. The only thing that needs to be borne in mind is that lenses of this generation don't send any electronic data to the camera body. Consequently, you'll need to enter a few bits of data manually before using the lens. This is done by going to the non-CPU lens data item in the setup menu, where you need to enter the lens's focal length and maximum aperture. When you click OK, the camera stores these two figures under a unique lens number. This allows you to recall these figures quickly whenever you put that particular lens back on your camera. I have a handful of manual lenses and their data are saved under numbers 1 through to 5. As you can see here, my lens number 1 is my 50mm f1.4. Whenever I connect that particular lens to my camera body, I simply select number 1 under this section and off I go. If you're interested in using a manual lens on your Nikon body, but aren't too keen on buying a lens that may be nearly 40 years old, then mention must be made of the simply gorgeous modern lenses which Zeiss make for the Nikon SLR body. These are a range of metal bodied manual lenses and the one we're having a look at here is the 50mm f1.4. This lens is a 7 element in 6 group version of Zeiss's classic planar design which dates back to the 1890s and optically gives results very similar to the Nikon AFS and AFD lenses. Standards of sharpness and resolution are every bit as good as the Nikon lenses and in use I'd have to say that I rather prefer the colour saturation of the Zeiss lens. In the pictures I've taken with it, I think it gives very slightly better colours, particularly when light levels are low. I don't have any direct A to B comparison shots, so this could just be my imagination. Nevertheless, the Zeiss lens's levels of barrel distortion are certainly lower than that of the AFS lens. Although the Nikon lens is built to a very high standard, it really does feel like a poor relation when compared to the all-metal Zeiss lens in terms of handling and build quality. With its all-metal construction throughout and engraved and painted markings, it really is in a different league to the plastic-covered Nikon. From the minute you turn its syrupy smooth focusing ring, the Zeiss lens gives every impression of having been lovingly hand carved from a single block of metal somewhere in Germany. However, in the case of these modern Zeiss lenses this is not actually the case, and they're actually mass produced by Casina in Japan. Nevertheless, the Zeiss lens does hark back to a different age of lens construction and is an absolute delight to use. Incidentally, if you're interested in one of these lenses, be sure to buy the correct version for your Nikon DSLR. Zeiss make three variations of this lens, the ZE, the ZF and the ZF2. The ZE version is designed to fit Canon bodies and either of the ZF versions will fit Nikon F mount SLRs. The ZF lens is entirely mechanical, rather in the style of Nikon's manual AIS lenses. The ZF2 lenses have a CPU on board which can send aperture information electronically to the camera body. In practice this means that with the ZF lens you set the aperture by twisting a ring around the lens throat, whereas with the ZF2 you can set it by turning a little wheel on the camera body. This also means that the ZF2 gives access to program and shutter priority modes. My lens here is a ZF version, which means I have to input some lens data manually, as shown earlier in this section, and change the aperture by twisting the ring around the lens. Apart from these two slight grumbles, it works absolutely perfectly on my D3S and D7000, and with the right kind of subject, is an absolute pleasure to use. If, like me, you often find yourself needing a focal length slightly wider than 50mm, then the 35mm focal length with its significantly wider but still very natural perspective can be just the thing. For things like buildings and landscapes, it can quickly become a lens that sits on your camera all day long. And when used close up to the subject, it can even produce very effective full length portraits. At this focal length, Nikon offer a long-standing f2 AFD design, along with more recent f1.4 and f1.8 AFS lenses. 
I've used the F2 AFD version for many years and absolutely love it to bits. Despite being a small, simple and lightweight lens, it delivers the traditionally high levels of optical quality you'd expect from a Nikon Prime lens. The f1.8 version offers the upgrade to the AFS focusing system, which in a lens as small and simple as this one makes almost no difference whatsoever. The f1.4 lens offers an extra stop of isolating power over the f2, which gives it an increased ability to isolate subjects at a focal length where depth of field is traditionally quite large. Although this can be a useful feature, the lens is much bigger and way more expensive than the little f2 version. As I've said, I've owned the cheap and cheerful f2 version for many years and had tremendous fun with it and never felt any need to upgrade to f1.4 or f1.8. If for some reason you require a focal length slightly narrower than 50mm, then Nikon offer a couple of prime lenses that fit the bill. Nikon do seem to have had a tradition of an extremely expensive lens at around the 58mm focal length for many years. If you like the sound of the 50mm f1.4 from this review, but have simply way too much money to get rid of quickly, then the 58mm f1.4 could be just what you're looking for. As far as I can see, the only difference between it and the 50mm f1.4 is that it's rather bigger and has a massively bigger price tag. Admittedly, optical quality of the 58mm lens is outstanding, but its improvements over the 50mm f1.4 are probably only going to be noticed in test shots. Moving up to the 60mm focal length, we come to the shortest of Nikon's special purpose macro lenses. There's a long-standing mechanical AFD version and a more recent AFS lens. I use the old-fashioned AFD lens for all the shots of lenses and their various controls, which you see in these reviews. As with any lens with micro nick or on the side, optical quality is outstanding, even when the subject is only a few inches from the camera lens itself. The AFS lens offers marginally faster autofocus, but this is rarely an issue with this type of photography. Despite its design for macro work, this lens continues to produce its outstanding optical quality with subjects at ordinary everyday distances. Consequently, it can perform extremely well as a standard lens, definitely matching the 50mm f1.4 in terms of optical quality. A very obvious alternative to the 50mm f1.4 which we haven't mentioned in this section would be one of Nikon's standard zoom lenses. These lenses allow you to zoom either side of the 50mm focal length, generally from 24, 28 or 35mm into 70 or 85mm. Very few of them can match the optical quality of the 50mm f1.4 standard lens and none of them can match its f1.4 aperture. A short review of Nikon standard zoom lenses can be found in the JK Lenses review of the 24-70 f2.8 lens. This lens provides a uniquely natural angle of view and perspective in a relatively small, light and inexpensive package. It does this at an extremely fast aperture whilst providing some of the best optical quality around. And if the cost of a new AFS lens is a problem, then there are older AF versions which will do an almost identical job for a good deal less money. Consequently, the conclusion here is an unqualified recommendation. I can't really imagine any photographer being unhappy after buying this lens. If you include the earlier AF models, then I've effectively owned this lens for over 25 years. And in that time, it's come pretty much everywhere with me. I've nearly always been able to find a use for it, and the results have always been excellent. I hope you've enjoyed this review and found something useful in it. If you have any comments to add, then please type them in the box below. I'm steadily working my way through the Nikon lens catalogue, so please subscribe. And as always, many thanks for watching.